Good morning. Christelle Guido and I, Allison Johnjack, are here on July 9th. We've had a few growers in central Wisconsin noticing um, rather high leafhopper populations. And leafhoppers are always going to be pretty much in every bed. Um, any sweep that you do, you'll find one or two. Um, but on these marshes, there's three of them right now uh, throughout central Wisconsin, kind of a, a broad spread, that are having 100 to 200 per sweep, it, you know, a set of 20 sweeps. And so we wanted to go over, if you're seeing um, populations of, of anything in those levels, um, we want to make sure that you know what that is and, and how to address it. So I'm going to show um, some of the feeding damage that's associated with having these really high leafhopper numbers. Um, and so you can see this is a, a vine that I picked um, just as bloom was beginning. Um, and you can see if it uh, notices where I'm pointing in that hooked leaf in the middle, um, the leaf hoppers, uh, you know, use their, their piercing yep. sucking mouth parts and at the bottom of the leaf, right in the vein where the, the sap is really sweet. Um, and I'll go through a couple of pictures. Um, here's a, a microscope view of that same thing. Here's the necrotic tissue where the, the leaf hopper is stolen, the, the good sticky carbohydrates that your plant was going to use. Um, and then a few uh, newer ones um, showing what that looks like and they're more developed. And then again, when we have those very high numbers, um, the, the damage across a lot of the new growth. Um, so if you are seeing enough leafhoppers that you're seeing damage like this, um, we want to make sure that you uh, have a little bit of background to, to go on. Um, so Christelle, can you talk about what we might see uh, pre-bloom versus post-bloom um, if you have uh, high, high numbers like this? Sure. So I guess I will start by saying what we mean a little bit about high numbers. Um, what we're talking about is about 100 or more in a, a 20 sweeps. If you get 10 or less than 10 or 20 in a sweep, that's not a lot because I, like Allison said, uh, leafhoppers are ubiquitous. They're in your backyard, in your grass, they're everywhere. So there's nothing to be alarmed by if you see leafhoppers hopping around. Um, what becomes a problem is when you see a lot of leafhoppers, but then you see the associated damage. And what we have is that uh, in, in pre-bloom pretty much is when we have the nymphs, so the immatures that don't fly, and they're the ones that feed the most. The adults feed less. And so they're the ones that are gonna be causing, and that's a picture of a nymph that Allison has here, that are really causing the damage by feeding on the plant um, xylem for the most part, but it can also feed on other tissues like the, the phloem and, um, and that, so that they can feed a little bit on everything. What's very noticeable um, about leafhoppers, and you'll hear that from all cropping systems, is that because they feed on the sap, they can also transmit a lot of diseases. And we'll talk about that a little later, but that's what makes them also economically important is depending on what they're vectoring, they might become even more of a problem than just that feeding damage. At this stage, what we've seen is the feeding damage caused by the nymphs pre-bloom that can be quite extensive if you have those high densities um, and should be taken care of primarily at pre-bloom because that's where the, the uh, products that we have overall, not in cranberry, work mu much better on the nymphs than they would on the adults. At this stage right now, we're post-bloom and or during bloom or towards the end of bloom, but now we have adults. And so the, the products that you can use now are really not going to do as well of a job as they would do on the nymphs. Products that can be used if you have those very high numbers, but I would suspect you would know already by now if you do have that, um, would be organophosphates such as diazonon or lorsdan. Um, and uh, carbamates such as seven. So some of those like diazonon you can still use now if you need it to come back, but you're not gonna have the efficacy you would have pre-bloom if you had uh, done that on the nymphs. And I'm again, just gonna show a few uh, photographs here. These are adults collected um, in one of those central Wisconsin marshes. And here's kind of a to scale picture if you're not zoomed in. Um, and then this is another microscope view of a nymph from earlier in the season. Um, so the nymphs can be, depending on what instar they're at, they can be various colors. Um, and, and so also what's important is that because they're, they're everywhere, there's a lot of different species of leafhoppers. We have in apple, we have apple leafhopper, we have potato leafhopper, 
we have this there's a lot of leaf upper species and so at this stage we don't really know which ones we have but we've also worked on trying to see what what kind of uh, leaf hoppers we have that are causing the damage and so maybe um do you think we can talk about that now Allison? Yeah, absolutely. so one thing that is difficult about leaf hopper identification is that you cannot tell what they are when they're nymphs um identif speciesation actually takes dissection of the adults so that you can tell the difference in their reproductive parts so that you you can't tell in a nymph because they don't have the reproductive parts to uh to be able to identify so we've had to uh wait in these uh in these infested beds to send in some samples um one of the one of the three two have not come back yet um one of the three uh does turn out to be the blunt nose leaf hopper which christelle do you want to give us a little back background on why that's a concern yeah so you might have heard of blunt nose leaf hopper um over the years um it's it's the uh leaf hopper and i forgot the limentri uh, vaccini something like that um that is the vector for uh, false blossom disease and so that's one that we've had to deal with in the early 1900s um, that caused a, a lot of problem in New Jersey and on the East Coast with the cranberries because that um, false blossom disease is caused by the phytoplasma. And there's a very nice publication that Patty McMahon has put together a couple of years ago that is available on the UW uh, Extension Learning Store. And we will share that again in the newsletter so that people can take a, a look at it again. But this is the, the blunt nose leaf hopper is the one that's known to vector this phytoplasma. And if you look a little more into the disease, uh, it, it will kill your vines. So it's really something that is um, problematic. The breeding programs that were starting in the early 1900s were to combat the, um, the false blossom disease and the preference of leaf hopper for this, the different cultivars. And they came out with Stevens and other cultivars that were showing resistance to this uh, disease. So we do know that there are differences in the different cultivars, though we don't know what they are at this stage, because of course, nobody has looked at that since very recently that we started seeing the blunt nose leaf hopper again. Uh, there has been um, a resurgence of them in, on the East Coast, in Massachusetts, in uh, uh, New Jersey. They are seeing, they have false blossom disease, and I'm sure you've all heard about that and they have blunt nose leaf hopper. In the last two years, between Ocean Spray and some projects we had, because we were worried, uh, and we had some kind of, uh, Patty McManus was seeing false blossom in Wisconsin, we looked in what we were sampling and didn't find last year or this year any blunt nose leaf hopper. Doesn't mean that they were gone, we have them here, it's not like they were eradicated, but we weren't seeing them and they're, pretty easily treatable with, like I mentioned, the organophosphates or carbamates. And so we're, we've been looking at that to see if there's a possibility that we have this vector for false blossom disease. And the results that came back this week from Allison and David Jones at Ocean Spray um, really show that we have blunt nose leaf hopper. So if you want to go back to the picture you have of, of all those adults, these really show they're hard to tell. I mean, if you don't know and if you are worried about high numbers of leaf hoppers, send us those, um, those samples. Um, yeah, sorry, my phone's ringing. You're good. You go ahead and send those samples to me um, and I can kind of triage them and, and send them up appropriately. Um, yeah. We, in order to get the best insect samples for insect identification, if you can, um, collect them in a baggie out of, after you've taken your, your sweeps, collect them into a baggie, um, and then take them back home and kind of put them into a little pill bottle or something that you've filled with ethanol or rubbing alcohol. Um, and then in order to mail them, uh, pour off the extra alcohol and put cotton balls in to absorb the extra alcohol. Yeah, and rubbing alcohol is totally fine. Um, and we have um, PJ Lee, she's our insect diagnostician, um, ocean spray, they've sent some to leaf hoppers experts, but that was because we're looking at nymphs. Once we have the adults, it's a lot easier to identify them. Um, um, I when think we other, have, go ahead. I, the, I think the other things that we want to um, be sure that we hit are um, watching monitoring sweeps pre-bloom. 
Yeah, so, yeah, exactly. Thank you, Alison. So right now, you can still, as you sweep, look for leaf hoppers. Again, if the numbers are not too high, don't don't spray for them. It's really not the, the point right now because the, the sprays are not going to be as effective and the numbers have to be really high. So in New Jersey, for example, Cesar Rodriguez Saona has been doing some work on um, blood nose leaf hopper and other leaf hoppers. And what he, they recommend there, where they do have false blossom, is number one, there's no economic threshold because we don't know how many of those leaf hoppers are actually carrying the vector, are carrying the phytoplasma. And so it's impossible to know how many leaf hoppers actually translate in the transmission of false blossom disease. What I found is that 100 to 200 sweep in, uh, in 25 sweeps in uh, Maine, University of Maine, they're saying that's really high. 10 to 20 is low in New Jersey. What they recommend in New Jersey is if you do those sweeps pre-bloom and you have 10 to 20, you don't need to spray. But if next year when you do it again, your numbers are increasing, then that's when you want to start looking at a pre-bloom spray. So we have those organophosphates, carbamates. Neonicotinoids work well as well, but they're not recommended pre-bloom because obviously, as we know, they'll be fine in the nectar and pollen, uh, and the bees will be uh, carrying that back to their hives. Um, when we talk about those organophosphates, uh, we also have to be careful because if we spray them too much, we're killing the natural enemies that we have for sparg and cranberry fruitworm, which are pretty high. And so we want to make sure we protect them. Mm -hmm. um, one thing I wanted to say was the, the big question right now, I think, is that is the false blossom disease. Because like I said, this feeding damage by leaf hoppers can, can be quite substantial, obviously, when we have those high densities and scary. But we can treat those leaf hoppers next year and in pre-bloom and pretty much take care of them. The problem becomes now we know we have this vector, this blood nose leaf hopper, how much false blossom do we have? And it's hard to tell because the symptoms may appear false blossom in a month or in a couple of years. So it's really hard to see. And again, we'll share the, the pamphlet from uh, um, the extension publication from Patty because it has pictures and it really shows you the witch's broom and the aborted uh, flowers and, and all the description of that. And it's really nice. So um, there are things like that that we, uh, we need to, we still have a lot of questions and we don't know how widespread that false blossom disease is. And so from a blunt nose leaf hopper standpoint, we're still at the point of looking at high densities is what we're worried about from a feeding damage standpoint at this stage. If, if I can just add a little bit to that, um, one of the things that makes it hard to know a lot about false blossom is that it is a phytoplasma. So you can think of it like a bacteria, except it's the very weakest bacteria possible. It cannot live unless it is in the tissue of a plant or the saliva of the blunt nose leafhopper. So if you try to take it to a lab and do research, it, it's really difficult because it's dying as soon as it's outside of a plant. So, it, and then that's also worth, noted, worth noting, a leafhopper that feeds on a healthy cranberry plant and goes and feeds on another healthy cranberry plant yes, you're gonna have that leaf damage, but if it has not come into contact with that bacteria, then it's not carrying that bacteria. So if you're in an area that hasn't had false blossom, um, you should be, you, you don't have to be as concerned that, that, that this is gonna be vectored. Just wanted to add that. Yeah, for sure, that's a great, great point. So they do transmit it and, and pick it up by feeding on an infected plant, a plant with phytoplasma, they pick it up as they, feed, as they feed on the sap, and then they have to go feed on an uninfected plant and then have to transmit it. That doesn't mean every time they're gonna feed, they're gonna transmit. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, it's something that um, is not a, a very simple process, obviously. And like I, we said, the, the symptoms may take a couple of years to show up for false blossom. Mm -hmm. so. so we're gonna be keeping an eye on, on the situations at these three marshes that have the very high densities. And we're gonna be keeping an eye on what species they turn out to be and, and watching the symptoms in the coming years. And just wanted to remind everyone to check, um, you know, every year you're taking your, your pre broom sweeps and record your populations of leafhoppers over the course of years. And if you see them increasing from one year to the next, you know, then maybe it's time to consider that pre bloom spray, but not overdoing that so that we don't harm the, the beneficial uh, natural enemies. 
Um, anything else we want to add before the end of our, our recap here, Crystal? Sure. I just realized I didn't mention that Jack and I are uh, set up some trials. So he's going to do some post-bloom trials because that's where we're at. And we decided that two days or yesterday. Um, so we're going to do some post-bloom. Um, I just want everybody to know that there has been trials in New Jersey. So we know like the organophosphates and all those. Um, Movento was one that one of the growers asked me was shown to not work at all on leaf hoppers. So don't, no need to spray Movento. It's expensive too. So uh, save your money on there. But we'll give you more information about that. And of course, we'll have trials next year pre-bloom to really see we have some um, products new ones and old ones that we could we are going to revisit and could show a good efficacy because there's a lot of data on leaf hoppers in other cropping systems so we know how efficacious they are on a lot of other leaf hoppers which is likely to be the same for our leaf hoppers so we have more questions and answers but we're working on it i'm excited to, to see the results of those trials um Excellent. And so if you have any questions, always feel free to reach out to me, um, allison.johnjack at wisc.edu um, and Christelle as well. And we will look forward to uh, look forward to the rest of the growing season. Okay. Thank you, Allison.